Is it on? Okay. Welcome, everyone, to the session on climate security and agriculture strategies for inclusive adaptation. This organization, so this event has been organized by the government of Ireland, CGIAR, the Rockefeller Foundation, Georgetown University's Institute for Women, Peace, and Security. My name is Patty Fong from the Global Alliance for the Future Food, and I'll be moderating this event. This event will include policymakers, experts, and grassroots leaders who will share their strategies for how to, on locally based agronomic solutions and strategies for ensuring an inclusive and resilient global food system. Our latest research shows that just 3% of climate finance is going to food systems, even though food systems contributes to one third of all global greenhouse gas emissions. And our research also shows that most national climate plans, the NDCs, are not prioritizing food systems. In fact, nearly three quarters of those NDCs lacked sufficient detail, which is needed to secure climate finance. So we need both um, countries to prioritize food system measures to get finance in their NDCs. We need donor countries to step up and provide more finance. And most importantly, we need to structure the finance in the right way so that it gets to those who really need it. So with that, to kick us off, we're gonna have a couple of opening speakers. I'd first like to invite Ms. Sinead Walsh, Director of the Climate Unit at the Development and Development Cooperation and Africa Division of Ireland's Department of Foreign Affairs. So Sinead, please come up. So much. Um, I'm actually representing our. Um, I'm actually representing our minister, uh, our minister uh, Colin Brophy, who unfortunately had a, a very severe flight delay. So uh, he has asked me to deliver his uh, his remarks and also to send uh, his apologies. Um, so so thank you very much uh, and good morning uh, everyone. Uh, I, I first of all want to thank uh, CJAR, FAO, Rockefeller uh, and Georgetown for organizing this uh, event. Um, we know that the cumulative impacts of, of climate change, COVID um, and indeed conflict in many parts of the world have exposed uh, the underlying fragility uh, of global and local um, food systems and food security. Uh, extreme impacts of this fragility and just imagine for a second that I am Minister Colin Brophy. They are very fresh in his mind because he visited uh, the Horn of Africa um, in, in early September and he was uh, extremely struck uh, by the devastation um, that is being wreaked upon uh, communities there. Um, the effects of the current drought are on the one hand uh, a harbinger of things to come as climate impacts worsen. Uh, but at the same time, uh, the situation which, as we know, is approaching famine in the 21st century in some parts of Somalia should never be allowed to happen again. We have much to do to prevent such situations occurring, and this includes uh, tackling these underlying fragilities of food systems. However, as we all know, the war in Ukraine has served to further accelerate and deepen this fragility. In this context, the world community gathers here at COP27 to renew its focus on how climate change is impacting on all of our lives and to give further impetus and direction to our existing commitments. Ireland places agriculture within a broader framework of sustainable food systems that includes not just food production, but processing, distribution and consumption. A food systems approach also demands cross-governmental ways of working between ministries of agriculture, health, environment, and others. It seeks engagement of civil society and the private sector as well as the public sector. At the UN Food Systems Summit in 2021, Ireland committed to support food systems transformation at both global and country levels. Uh, Ireland was therefore pleased to provide catalytic funding for the work of the FAO-led Food Systems Transformation Coordination Hub while it's right to acknowledge that the food and agriculture sector is a significant driver of emissions and therefore contributes to climate change, uh, climate change in turn puts strains on the food and agriculture production. Droughts, floods, irregular rainfall patterns and heat waves can directly disrupt agricultural cycles, increase desertification and nutrient deficiency in soils. 
This leads to a significant loss of yield, declining household income, and increasing food security. And we know, too, that communities and countries that contribute least to the climate crisis are some of the most vulnerable to its effects. Therefore, our efforts must focus on adaptation strategies and initiatives for the countries and communities that will be the most impacted. This means supporting smallholder farmers and possibly assisting longer-term transitions for food and livelihood systems that may face existential threats, um, for example, in some pastoralist and agro-pastoralist communities, not least indeed in the Horn of Africa. Um, last year at COP26 in Glasgow, uh, Ireland joined the Aim for Sea. Um, I'm sure you all know the Agriculture Innovation Mission for Climate, uh, led by the US and the UAE. Uh, and under Aim for Sea, Ireland has committed to increase investment in agricultural uh, innovation for climate smart agriculture and food systems. Uh, and we really look forward to uh, further engagement in this important partnership at this COP27 event and beyond. Um, Ireland was also pleased to support the CGIAR research program on climate change, agriculture and food security. Uh, this research confirmed that any effort to increase productivity and manage climate risks better will be unsuccessful if it does not address the differences in how women and men engage in agriculture. Farming women and men in developing countries have different vulnerabilities and different capacities to deal with the impact of climate change on their livelihoods. This includes important differences between men and women with regard to accessing financial capital and ownership and use rights over property, land, water, livestock, grazing, fisheries, and, and so many other issues. Uh, so this taken together with poor access to education, social protection, and health services, these differences place female-headed households uh, among the most vulnerable sections of the rural poor. From a broader food systems perspective, we must ensure that we fully understand and indeed that opportunities, uh, not just with regard to food production, but also with regard to processing, distribution, and consumption are acted upon. Um, for Ireland, we believe we should go further. We believe that deeper gender transformative approaches are possible and indeed essential to address these barriers and constraints. These approaches seek to change deeply embedded socio-cultural norms and beliefs, as well as to achieve lasting social change for gender equality and women's empowerment. Adoption of such approaches takes courage, persistence, and dedicated resources. Speaking of resources, this year Ireland was pleased to strengthen its long-standing partnership with CJIR. Uh, we commend the efforts of the CJIR senior leadership on significant governance and strategic reforms that the organization has undergone in the last two years. And this is where I want you to really, if you're talking to anybody about this, about this event, this next paragraph, the minister said it himself. You can just. Close your eyes and just imagine. Uh, so he, I, he, is therefore pleased to announce today uh, Ireland's pledge of 14 million euros uh, over the next three year period, 2022 to 2024, to CJIR. Uh, we look forward to our, uh, our participation in the CJIR Systems Council uh, to support the current organizational transition and the vision for the transformation of food, land, and water systems in the current uh, climate crisis. So delighted uh, on behalf of the minister to have made his announcement uh, this morning. Uh, and thanks so much for this event and really looking forward uh, to listening to the panel. Uh, and, and you will hear a lot more Irish input on the panel because our food systems envoy, uh, special envoy Tom Arnold uh, is, is, on, is on the panel. So, uh, so there's more, more to come from Ireland, but thank you so much uh, for listening. Thank you, Sinead. That's a very exciting announcement. And so now we will hear from Claudia Sadoff from CGIR. She's Executive Managing Director. So what is your response to that 14 million? <laughs> As you might imagine, tremendous gratitude. But more formally, let me begin. Director of the Climate Unit and Special Envoy for, uh, for Climate, Sinead Walsh. Um, Special Envoy for Food Systems, Tom Arnold. Uh, distinguished guests, colleagues, so good, so good to welcome you all here today. It's really a pleasure to be convening um, this important dialogue at the CGIR FAO Rockefeller Pavilion for Food and Agriculture. And let me truly begin by formally expressing our extreme gratitude for the recent pledge and support from Ireland's Department of Foreign Affairs. We particularly recognize how strategic this investment is because it aims to bring resilience 
um, to food systems across the global south that are struggling with the triple threat of COVID, climate, and conflict. The contribution that you're making specifically will really strengthen our ability to scale up inclusive agri-food systems innovations, helping to inform policies that benefit poor farmers and consumers, and sharing knowledge to improve productivity. The gap in uh, investment in food systems that was identified by the series 2020 report that we had all read remains very strong and very wide. And therefore, this particular uh, contribution is, is very welcome news because the fact is that our changing climate really is putting at risk our global food systems. The continued rise in temperatures not only diminishes productivity, but it actually lowers the nutritive value of the food that we do grow increasing risks of hunger and poverty and compromising the development of our children. But today, what's exciting is this focus on committing to inclusion and inclusivity. I recently published an op-ed that spoke to one specific area that if addressed systematically, we believe could achieve enormous gains in food systems, transformation and inclusion. And I think that that's a very relevant theme today. I cited a report by CARE that showed that 18 million more women than men were hungry or food insecure in 2018. And that was shocking, 18 million more women than men. But since then, there's been a really unconscionable rise in that number. And in 2021, 150 million more women than men were food insecure. That's an incredible gender gap. It's really unacceptable. The fact that women are shouldering such a staggeringly disproportionate burden in the current global food crisis. The same research highlighted that in places of greater inequity, there is also greater hunger. And that's a cruel irony, frankly as we know that women play such an important role in food systems. So it's clear we cannot reach any goal of zero hunger, nor confront the climate crisis itself without attacking this tremendous inequity in gender. Not only are women more vulnerable to climate-related disasters, but women and girls are more likely to go hungry in the aftermath of extreme weather events. Rural women are less able to adapt to climate-related disasters and diversify their agricultural livelihoods in the face of drought, floods, or heat waves. We all have the opportunity here at Sharm El Sheikh to build on the recognition that was so strong in COP26 that women and girls both face a disproportionate burden from climate change, but that they also therefore represent a tremendous unfulfilled potential if we support them to confront climate change and adapt to its consequences. So CGIR's ongoing research has begun to identify, for example, hotspots in nearly 90 low to, low, uh, to mid-income countries that show areas of concern with three overlapping traits. A high likelihood of climate hazards, a uh, high proportion of women in agriculture, and high levels of gender inequality. These are areas that deserve special attention and special focus from our work. And it's this type of analysis that we hope will help guide our climate investments and help drive greater inclusion in climate action, help target those areas of both hazard and inequity that we all find so unacceptable. So in this adaptation COP, we need to encourage all of the parties to ensure that more resources are directed to countries and to rural women who deserve that protection and support the most. So with that in mind, let me thank again the Government of Ireland, Irish Aid, for this opportunity to give additional attention and effort to this important topic and thank everyone for gathering here today for this truly important conversation. Thank you all so much. We're now going to have a short panel discussion. So I'm joined up here by 
for experts and leaders. So we, first we have Tom Arnold, who's Ireland's Special Envoy on Food System. Next we have Anne Vaughan, Senior Advisor for Climate Change, Bureau for Resilience and Food Security at USAID. Then we have Mansi Shah, Senior Technical Coordinator at the Self-Employed Women's Association of India. And finally, we have Ali Abu Saba, Regional Director of the MENA Region of CGIR and Director General of the International Center for Agricultural Research in the Dry Areas. So first question goes to Tom. How are you implementing Ireland's holistic food system approach in a sustainable and equitable way? And how is Ireland supporting local stakeholders? And what lessons can others learn from this? Well, Ireland, this word inclusive adaptation is very important here. Um, and Ireland has had a tradition of developing its own agri-food strategy uh, involving the stakeholders involved in the sector. Uh, we're on the fifth such enterprise, such uh, exercise uh, recently, uh, and it, it ended up, it, it was finalized last year, it's called Food Vision 2030. Uh, I chaired it, and the conclusion was that Ireland wants to become leader in sustainable food systems over the coming decade. Now that's a, a big ambition, uh, but uh, we've spelled out in our strategy document how we should go that. We have four high-level missions and a series of goals uh, beneath that, and there is a, an implementation framework which hopefully will uh, monitor that the, it's actually being implemented, that what is committed to in this strategy is delivered. Now, I just want to talk about one particular aspect of this strategy, which I think is particularly important in the context of today's discussion. There's a commitment in our Food Vision 2030 that there should be a coherence between what we want to do in our domestic policy to be a leader in sustainable food systems and in our foreign policy. That's the first time any such formal commitment has been made in an Irish agri-food strategy. And it has a very direct relevance because it connects in with the agenda of work which was defined last year, particularly in two uh, international meetings, the Food System Summit in September last year and the Nutrition for Growth uh, Summit in, in, in December. Uh, and we are trying to take seriously the, the, the outcome of the Food Systems Summit where over 100 countries committed to going down the food systems transformation route. And we think that in our, both in our, the process by which we develop our own agri-food strategy and within our Irish aid program, there are very fruitful connections that can be made as we go forward. So we, we are attempting to identify a limited number of African countries with whom we can partner fairly substantially over the coming years, which will work in the direction of sustainable food systems. And part of that will have to be a serious attempt at climate adaptation. So that's what, uh, if you like, our immediate policy framework is. And I think we're in a good place to take this agenda forward. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Next, we're going to turn to Anne Vaughan. Anne, from your experience of working at the intersection of food security, nutrition, and climate change at USAID, what approaches have been most successful, and how are you uplifting local communities and small shareholders, particularly women, on the front lines of the climate crisis? Sure. Thanks. Thanks so much, and thanks for the host for organizing this. I was going to talk. Sorry. Um, thanks so much to the host for organizing. I was going to talk about you can't understand an approach until you understand the problem. But I think our our, our keynote speakers identified the problem extremely well about the different levels of, of problems that uh, women have in access to. In, uh, climate information services, extension work, you name it, it's harder for smallholder women farmers. And I think as our USAID administrator puts it very eloquently, um, 
climate change is sexist, our response doesn't have to be. So I think we've in, in really internalized that at USAID, including in our, in our climate strategy that we released last uh, day, and are, are working to try to make sure we're inputting inclusion, not just of women, but other marginalized people um, from indigenous populations um, uh, to, to the elderly uh, and to youth to make sure are incorporated into the work that we're doing. So a couple things that we're doing to address this, besides working closely with our Irish counterparts um, in, in the Sun Network and donor networks and with our G7 colleagues to really try to elevate nutrition within the climate and food security conversation. And as Claudia was saying, we really hope this COP and then the whole 2023 um, continues to, we continue to elevate nutrition in the conversations around climate change to make sure um, that we're addressing the threat that climate change poses to nutrition for women and children around the world. And specifically to actions that we're doing to try to localize, um, to, to support localization, um, we've, the administrators also announced some very ambitious and exciting targets around localization where by 2030, we're expected as an agency to try to make sure we're co-designing across our humanitarian and development work about 50% of our programs and are also looking to fund about 25% of our work um, directly to local organizations in the next couple of years. So I think we're putting the heart of how do we put communities first and that of course would have a very strong component of making sure that women-led organizations and women have seats at the table um, across our work but especially I think in food systems where we see women so marginalized and receiving so much less of the innovations that they need. Um, to advance their work, and that gets to the uh, work on innovation and investments in the research and development that will help uh, smallholder farmers around the world survive the climate crisis. So we're also very pleased to work um, on the Agriculture Innovation Mission for Climate and with our CG friends um, to in, um, uh, for investments in climate smart ag and food systems. and made a commitment last year for $215 million over five years um, towards the CG system to help advance um, uh, more, more climate smart agriculture across sub-Saharan Africa and Asia. So very excited to continue to partner uh, with the CG system on that and with other partners in the aim for c initiative. So just a couple things. I forgot one very important point that when it comes to programming, if we don't do inclusive development analysis, inclusive, sorry, early on, early on in the program and design of programs, we're going to start leaving women and other marginalized groups behind because if we don't intentionally program with people, you get left behind. So a little bit of a program for the end. Thanks. That's a very important important final point and and I saw Mansi nodding vigorously as you're making that point Mansi you work with smallholder women farmers in India um, and you have seen firsthand the disproportionate impacts on climate change so tell us about your work with women farmers and especially you know it's not about new innovation we know solutions exist we know how it needs to work tell us what does actually work with your initiatives Thank you so much, and I would like to first thank you, all the organizations, the uh, Ministry of Ireland, uh, Rockefeller Foundation, Georgetown University, and CGIR for inviting me here and giving me this opportunity to bring to this platform the voices of the poor informal sector women workers from the country of India and from the global south, the members of SEVA. Uh, Self-Employed Women's Association, SEVA, is a member-based organization of over 2.2 million poor self-employed women workers from the informal economy. Uh, our member, uh, uh, with the twin goals of uh, facilitating full employment and self-reliance to our members, SEVA has been organizing uh, poor women for over five decades now from over 125 different trades and 18 states in India. And we have also spread our wings to seven South Asian countries and also African countries. Um, 60% of our members uh, are rural, and agriculture is one of the major occupation. Uh, and we have seen firsthand how, due to increasingly frequent climate shocks, such as uh, you know uh, extended droughts, uh, extend, uh, unseasonal rains, shifting seasons, uh, harsh winters, intense and dry summers, and so on and so forth, uh, agriculture has uh, transformed from sustainable and viable 
sustainable profession to mere subsistence farming and this has led to two major uh, aspects uh, the men and the youth are shifting out of agriculture into different trades such as uh, far, uh, such as construction transportation and so on and the women are taking up predominantly all the agricultural responsibilities uh, however both men and women are very poorly equipped with skills and capacity for this new roles that they are taking on and this is leading to reduced uh, productivity increased input cost and overall uh, uh, low uh, living incomes uh, when the incomes of the families decrease it has a direct especially for the informal sector worker it has a direct impact on their food supply and when the food supply in a household diminishes women having an intrinsic uh, tendency of putting family first always uh, tend to go hungry and thus uh, reduction in productivity and in income leads to food and insecurity for women workers understanding these issues and challenges faced by over 60% of our members seva initiated the agricultural campaign in 1989 which is based on four major pillars capacity building affordable access to agriculture inputs and technology access to finance and market linkages um campaign uh, seva provides uh, technical and technological trainings to our members uh, using uh, various uh, techno i mean stacking of technologies such as you know video based extension services uh, audio messages uh, posters and so on and uh, we also provide them with demonstrative pilots to uh, have a hands on experience of new agro agro technologies and then we provide them with market linkages so that women who do not have voice and visibility as a farmer is able to eliminate the middleman and access direct direct market um, the agricultural campaign by seva was initiated in 1989 and till date we have been able to reach out to over 600000 poor small and marginal farmers and this also includes uh, share croppers and And landless agricultural laborers, and uh, we have been able to transform their agriculture from mere subsistence farming to sustainable and viable agriculture. Um, and the success of Seva's agricultural campaign has shown that uh, such initiatives, if they are scaled up, uh, they would not only make agriculture sustainable, viable, and profitable for the smallholders, but it will also address the food and nutrition security issues at the global level, uh, issues of access. To to energy for the rural areas and it will also generate livelihood opportunities for the rural youth thereby curbing rural out migration and uh, mitigate the poverty through asset creation and reduce the carbon footprint of the uh, women uh, another uh, one small such initiative that seva has piloted recently is uh, seva serves as an aggregator to cumulatively um, uh, uh, seva serves as an aggregator for the uh, carbon savings uh, although uh, minimal at household level but uh, significant cumulatively and links the women to the carbon trading market thereby generating additional livelihood opportunities for the members and making the clean green energy solutions in the agricultural sector uh, so affordable and uh, viable for the rural workers so i just uh, want to just uh, add uh, uh, just one small point that uh, uh, what that uh, our experience implementing this agricultural campaign has shown that there is an urgent need for the public and the private sector as well as the philanthropic foundations to come together and set up an agricultural stabilization fund a fund that would help build the resilience of the small and marginal farmers and uh, against the increasingly frequent climate shocks and as well as the market shocks it would be a financial product which would be a mix of grant patient capital soft loans equity and it will provide uh, it will be an instrument which is appropriate to the small and marginal farmers and it will enable in doubling their income and thus making agriculture sustainable viable and profitable thank you Thank you, Manzi. Next, I turn to Ali Abu Saba. Um, from your extensive research on dryland agriculture and work in the MENA region, what examples do you have as best practice? What has worked that you've seen 
And where does the field need to focus in order to address these new and accelerating challenges? Hello. Uh, thank you very much for the question. Uh, like you all know, uh, MENA region is uh, one of the hardest hit uh, parts uh, in Africa and probably even globally in terms of the negative impact of climate change. Historically, water is scarce and the climate change is making it even worse. The desertification is expanding. Uh, lands are de getting more and more degraded and the uh, unmanageable uh, extraction of groundwater in areas where agriculture is being developed is uh, risking the long-term viability and livelihoods of people in the region. So within the CGIAR, uh, what we are trying to do is to bring in a capacity from across the system to work together in ways like we have not done before. Uh, CGIAR had, uh, uh, you know, presence of uh, multiple centers in the region focusing on water, focusing on crops, focusing on livestock, focusing on uh, aquaculture. But this region now needs integration among all of these components. And within the uh, CGIR reform, uh, now under one strategy, uh, we are able to actually uh, harness the capacity, uh, the scientific capacity and innovations. CGIR has 50 years of innovations in all of these domains. So the question becomes then, how do you aggregate? How do you co-create? How do you co-develop? How do you bring in the uh, opportunities uh, for creating a greater and stronger communities in the region that are capable to withstand uh, and survive the negative impact of climate change. This requires uh, high-level dialogues at the level of the ministries, the planning teams. This requires a lot of engagement from the CGIR at all levels, starting from the farmers all the way uh, you know, to the top ends, including the private sector, special emphasis, emphasis on women groups and societies. But more broadly, within the drylands, there is a lot of communities outside the traditional cities and regular stand farmers. And those need to be brought in. When you really uh, design those uh, adaptation, adaptation strategies and solutions, you need to make sure that you are inclusive in your approach. They are part of the design. They need to decide what their priorities are. They need to decide what solutions work best for them. So lately, we've been uh, promoting a, a new concept of integrated desert farming that seeks to bring in the aquaculture to maximize the use of water before we can actually take the water, put it on the crops. We're able to look at the policy issues, water pricing, extraction and regulation of uh, water, uh, groundwater extraction. How do you bring in the latest technologies? Some of the technologies in farmer fields today is like 20, 30 years old. So the technologies available within the research system is far more advanced than what actually farmers are using. So these actions combined, we hope, will be able to make a strong contribution, working with our partners and all the institutions at all levels to bring in the adaptive capacity that the rural population and the population in general in this part of the world would require. Thank you. Thank you. So I heard some key words, co-creation across ministries, across within the CG network, from global to local, inclusive participation across sectors, right? Communities, private sector, governments, um, and especially with local communities that are most impacted. So we have a few minutes for questions. Um, if there's any questions, please raise your hand. Is there a mic, roaming mic? Thank you. Thank you. Check, check, there we go. Uh, yeah, uh, my name is Todd Crane I'm from the International Livestock Research Institute in Nairobi. I have two interrelated questions. Uh, we see often that commercialization masculinizes uh, agricultural commodities. So what had been women's crops or, or uh, products become men's, partly because of uh, taking over, partly because of uh, markets being more masculine spaces. So first question is, how do we prevent that? How do we address it? Uh, and relatedly, in the panel, we've seen a lot of references to women and women's training, capacity building, access to resources, et cetera. But gender, of course, is a relational thing, and a lot of uh, women's issues and access to benefit is a function of men's behavior. Uh, we'll put it that way. So how do you engage men in g women's inclusivity in agricultural markets? 
let's take a, a second question. I know there's another one, and then, and then we'll go back to the panel. Thanks very much. Evan Fraser, uh, University of Guelph. Sort of a question for Tom, but would love to hear the panel's uh, thoughts on this. Uh, it's the role of science in informing informed pol the role of science in informing policy and uh, w science to your point is often a man's activity we're talking a lot about marginalization so how to create an inclusive environment where science can be applied in a way that empowers marginal speakers I'd love I'd love your thoughts on that thank you all right shall we um, take these short question and then we'll go back to panel one more there Hi everyone, uh, my name is Stador and I belong to an indigenous community in India. I work for university in London. Uh, my question is, we're talking about strategies for inclusive adaptation, um, but where do you bring you know, the indigenous communities, especially women, in terms of you know, strategies, access to finance, uh, adaptation of technology? Um, I, I think that's my question. Where, you know, where, where, do you, where does this fit in? Just to clarify, your question is how to, what, what does it mean in practice to have inclusive strategies? Yeah, for indigenous, uh, indigenous uh, communities. Uh, communities yeah. Okay. Did everyone get the four questions? Yes? Anyone want to tackle any of the four? Who wants to go first? I could start with the indigenous populations. Thanks for the question. Um, our climate strategy that came out in April, would actually, we actually have a target. Um, to make sure that we're working with indigenous people and indigenous populations in our climate work. So we're trying to be very intentional about that and now have to make sure across our work and in the implementation of the strategy, we're meeting that target. So I, I think it's, it's good to push governments and donors to say, show me the numbers. <laughs> Where are you doing this? Because we um, intentionally put that in our strategy to, to try to be um, thoughtful and, and comprehensive about that. I love the gender and science question. Um, also very eager to hear your thoughts on this, but one of the things that we've funded over the years, something called G-Chan, and actually trying to help get scientists, female scientists, and there's a wonderful website, I'm gonna get it wrong, happy to follow up, that actually shows in different countries the number of male versus female agronomist scientists, and it is not good. And it's something that we need to continue to work on, and one of the things that we uh, launched at the last COP um, was um, the acronym, I'm still learning the acronym, but it's G-E-E-A, but it's trying to basically um, crowd in um, more women into um, climate smart and green efforts and activities um, and, and green job space that addresses some of your question in the back about being intentional about um, funds. And we committed 16 million last year, but there was so much interest from around our missions around the world is that we've now um, been able to, to spend 21 million or committed to spending 21 million just in that narrow sort of how do we get women in green, um, in green jobs and leading, leading, not just counting numbers, but actually being women owned and, and getting women at the table. So thanks. I'm gonna hand it over to, to Tom. Um, I would love to have you answer the question from the first one about technology and technical systems, um, sometimes, oftentimes, masking the kind of expansion of commodity production. Um, well, thank you, Evan. I mean, the way I look at this is taking a long-term view. 50 years ago, the world was facing a major threat of mass starvation. One of the responses to that was the development of the Green Revolution, which put off that threat and uh, we now face, over the next 30 years, two major challenges. How we're going to feed approximately 10 billion people and how we're going to do it while keeping global warming down to, if we can, 1.5%, although this week's Economist put some question marks about that. So what we need is what's called a doubly green revolution. Uh, this is a, a concept, an idea, that Gordon Conway uh, produced in a book uh, 20 years ago, it's become ever more relevant. And I would see what uh, the 1CG system, uh, the, the re rethinking of what the CG is about, needs to do over the coming decades as really moving in this direction. So that's, uh, the, I think, an absolutely key issue. Last year in the Food Systems Summit, 
there was some really important work done by the scientific group led by Joachim von Braun, who, sp who spelled out the potential that science has to deal with the sustainability challenge. And then the final point I want to make is the role of women uh, within this, you know, within this, uh, uh, what needs to be done on the way forward. It's crucially important that women are involved in this at the level of uh, being given access to science and opportunities. But this has to be seen in a much wider context. Uh, I mean, what really has to happen in most developing countries, and indeed most countries, I think, is a revaluation of the status of women. They have to be valued in a much, to a much greater extent uh, than they have been, and their role in science is only one small part of that revaluation of the role. Thank you, Tom. You know, every year over 600 billion a year is spent on public subsidies for agricultural production, and the majority is going towards commodity co crop production. Um, Mansi, I want you to kind of, I want to still want to stick with this question a bit, and from your perspective, what are you seeing? You know, there's not very much money going to uh, production of indigenous crop varieties towards fruits and vegetables, and this is so important for um, local farmers, local farmers, for subsistence farmers to feed their own community. So, what do you see as the challenges, and uh, what are you facing in terms of the types of finance that are provided, and what it's going towards versus what's actually needed? Um, thank you, Paddy. And actually, I completely agree. In fact, if you would look at traditionally, agriculture was always for uh, feeding your own family. In a village, uh, uh, there would be a set of farmers who would be growing millet, other set would be growing pulses, other would be growing fruits and vegetables, and they would have an internal barter system. And therefore, no one had no none of the farmer families had to actually uh, rely on the retail market for purchasing their uh, uh, food for their household consumption however uh, as uh, especially uh, I mean agriculture be being a uh, traditional uh, occupation and the land being inherited from generation to generation so uh, because of that land defragmentation is happening and now because the land holding is smaller and the aspirations of the youth is uh, more uh, is towards you know technology they want to go out by smartphones and uh, urban urban impacts of urbanization so therefore for the demand for higher uh, valued crops is more and therefore the families are shifting to cash crops instead of uh, food grain crops which they can sell and then you know uh, uh, purchase uh, fulfill the demands of their younger generation but then uh, over this past two years, during the COVID crisis, uh, the smallholder farmers have started realizing because the retail prices of the millets, the food grains had become so high and the families who did not cultivate these food grain crops had to purchase it from the retail market and it was really unaffordable from that. And this whole COVID has again brought the importance of switching back to food grain crops and therefore, uh, but now th that traditional knowledge about how to cultivate food grain crops has uh, started uh, being uh, washed away. And therefore, there is an important need, urgent need for capacity building on techniques. And te uh, secondly, there is also need for policies, public policies, like the public procurement system. If they are focusing more on procuring local uh, crops and uh, distributing local crops. That would also uh, lead to, uh, you know, promote uh, more uh, cultivation of local and uh, crop diversification. So I think the, these are a few uh, things. And I also wanted to take uh, answer to the science question um, that there are a lot of scientific inventions in the field of agriculture. However, as I said, because of land different fragmentation most of the over 70 percent of the farmers in india and in the countries of the global south are smallholder having a land holding less than one acre now the new scientific inventions and technology that is coming up is highly unaffordable and secondly there is a lack of awareness amongst the smallholder farmers about these new agricultural inventions Third, they are uh, risk averse because what if the technology fails? Their whole livelihood depends on this small uh, yield from this small 
farm and therefore what seva is doing is seva is setting up demonstrative pilots uh, on in every district in a cluster of vill uh, 25 villages so that the women can come and see uh, first hand experience this kind of new technologies i'll just give you one small example of precision irrigation that we have just piloted the cost of the precision irrigation system was about 95000 uh, Indian rupees and the farmers were very reluctant to invest in that uh, precision irrigation technique. Uh, however, Seva did a demonstrative pilot on one, for, uh, one farmer's half acre of land and the yield was three times the regular flood irrigated field and also the input cost and due, uh, the weeding cost everything came down and because of that the farmer on whose field we did the demonstrative pilot was able to repay the entire uh, system in just one season and therefore looking at the success of this technology the entire village is now demanding for that kind of technology. So demonstrative pilots are very important for promoting new scientific inventions in agriculture, especially in uh, global south countries with the small and marginal farmers. Thank you. Fancy. So before we close, I want to give Ali the last word. So there's a number of questions you can pick from, but I would love to hear from the your perspective in the MENA region. Are you seeing tensions between what local communities need based on what they're experiencing from COVID, climate change, um, you know, the Ukraine war um, versus like where the kind of the research is? You know, it takes a while when the CG system to shift sometimes. So what, what are you seeing? Uh, I, I will require three hours to answer this question. <laughs> so uh, within one minute, allow me to pick the question on uh, gender and it's a function of men's behavior. A, a small example we've seen in my early career in Swaziland, uh, where uh, the gender expert among the mission was trying to come up with a way to get men to understand. So they did a simple exercise where both the men's group and the women's group started to list the activities they do on a daily basis. And then we brought them together and they started to compare. The men could come up with about three or four things that they are doing routinely every day. The women came up with a list of about 25 things, right? And in front of the men, the men were shocked. They said, we never knew that they actually do all of this. And then they started to offer things that they can actually help with. So I think investing in raising awareness and making sure we educate the population, we should not take it for granted that people are born well under, you know, well conversed with, with the need to how to behave and those things. The, se the second question is about the indigenous crops and the local crops. In most cases, these are the crops that are most suited to deal with the negative impact of climate change. They have been adapted over the years and the gene banks that we keep within the CGIR across the globe has a wealth of these seeds that are collected, characterized, screened, and is used actually for the crop improvement. So I just wanted to mention that. And last, and of course, the whole issue of, uh, you know, MENA and Ukraine and, and the war is serious shortages of wheat supplies and the whole countries in the region are starting to reassess the whole concept of food, st uh, food security. There is a need to maintain a minimum level of self-sufficiency. You know, many of the economists in the room will, will, will disagree with me, but that's the reality on the ground, because with all the wealth that many countries have, food was simply not, at some point in time, was simply not available in the market with the disruption of the global uh, supply chains. So I'll leave it there in the interest of time and happy to discuss these issues bilaterally at any point in time. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Ali. Please join me in thanking the panel discussion. This has been a really interesting exchange.